Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. Our guest today is Laura Callanan, the founding partner of Upstart CoLab, and she has an amazingly ambitious goal to build an entire ecosystem to help connect the $17 trillion of impact investment and sustainable capital in the United States with the $900 billion creative economy. Laura was introduced to me through Gary Bowles, my guest on episode 14. I told him that I was looking for people that lived on the intersection of impact and the arts, and he told me that the one person I needed to talk to was Laura. In today's conversation, Laura makes a case for the creative economy as an impact investing priority, why artists as innovators are perfectly positioned to make a difference within their communities, as well as why they can sometimes be more resilient to change than other entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoy this week's conversation. This is Laura Callanan, and here she is talking about why she uses the terminology creative economy as opposed to arts and culture when talking to impact investors. Part of the reason that I steer away from talking about the word art in our work at Upstart Collab is because there's a whole pushback that there's any potential to make an, an impact investment there. And there's a group called the Global Impact Investing Network, the GIN. They're about 10 years old. They're a predominant body in the impact investing space. They have members from all over the planet, typically large institutional investors. And every year they poll their investors and report where their members are investing. And they produce this nice pie chart. And the pie chart talks about all of the categories in which GIN members are investing for impact. And so there's a slice of the pie around microfinance, and there's a slice of the pie around affordable housing, and there's a slice of the pie related to climate change and environmental issues, et cetera. And there's always a, a thin line on the pie chart labeled arts and culture with a 0% next to it because there's some rounding error, something less than 0.5% of members' capital is being deployed to this arts and culture category. And I couldn't believe that this was true. Just in the U.S. context, recognizing that the creative economy is 4.5% of our GDP, knowing that in the global economy, the creative economy was 3% of GDP when it was last measured about eight years ago, and the U.N. is now predicting that the creative economy will be 10% of the global economy in the coming years. 0% coming from investors who are looking to generate social and environmental impact just didn't make any sense. And we recognize that if we started to frame the conversation around creative industries, the creative economy, which to us includes both businesses and real estate, that then you reveal a lot of investable opportunities that can drive social and environmental impact. It definitely is interesting that historically arts and culture has been segmented off to its own little micro category, whereas creativity is super prevalent inside of every single entrepreneurial class. What I'm hearing from you is that you're trying to break down the silo that any form of creativity has been placed inside of. However, when you talk about the creative economy specifically as it relates to impact, not everything in the creative sector is impact. How do you differentiate between the two? The funnel through which we look at the world, the first uh, tier of the funnel is whether or not the business or the real estate project is in the creative economy. And there's 145 industries that we've identified as uh, representing the creative economy in the United States. What's interesting is the creative economy is typically defined on a regional basis because every region will claim different industries because it really is a representation of the heritage and culture of that place. So in the United States, the state of Michigan does not include food in its state definition of creative economy, but the state of Louisiana does. And if you know about New Orleans and Creole cooking and the whole vibe down there, it makes perfect sense that it's such a deep part of the culture and the tradition in Louisiana. And so for us, taking a national U.S. perspective, we looked at how states and regions coast to coast in the United States define creative economy, and we didn't exclude any of the industry codes that these definitions entail, and we added them all up together. Together. So our, our first tier in, in the funnel to get to opportunities that we'll focus on is whether something fits within this definition of the creative economy. But you're right, 
immediately the next consideration, is this a conventional business or conventional real estate project, which is simply trying to be successful and uh, generate a financial return exclusively for its owners, shareholders, equity owners? Or is this a project or a company that's thinking more broadly, that's considering its impact on its workers, its community, the planet, its environmental impacts? Is this a company or a real estate project that is being very clear and explicit about its intentions by using a corporate model, such as a public benefit corporation or a steward ownership model, defining to the leadership and potential investors that they're going to balance their profitability with their intentional purpose and mission trying to do good work in the world? We have not defined a unique set of impact metrics that we think are exclusive to the creative economy because, again, our goal is to attract existing impact investors to the creative economy by saying, look, all the types of impacts you care about, whether it's quality jobs, whether it's supporting women leaders, whether it's supporting Black entrepreneurs, whether it's thinking about environmental impacts, all the sorts of impact results you as investors are already seeking, you can achieve those in the creative economy. And then we're talking to art lovers, artists, cultural institutions with endowments to tune them in to the large conversation about sustainable and impact investing. So we look at this metrics impact investors are already uh, focused on jobs, environmental impact, community development, those types of things. Earlier, you mentioned that it wasn't so much that arts and culture wasn't being invested in. It just wasn't categorized properly. As an example, you said fashion would fall into manufacturing. So does that mean that you're just trying to fight for the definition and the recognition of arts and culture as its own independent category? Naming and framing around the creative economy was our first challenge. And then bringing it to light because these opportunities had been flying under the radar for most impact investors. We did a report a couple of years ago where we looked at 100 funds that had been investing in the creative economy and very few of them were doing it on purpose. There's a fund out of the UK, the Nesta Arts Impact Fund. Now they've come up with their second fund that they launched earlier this year. So there are two funds in the UK. There's a fund in Kenya, the HIVA Fund. These are examples of funds that are 100% impact and 100% arts, culture, and creativity. But those are very few. What we found was 100 funds that in aggregate represent $60 billion of capital, all of which were investing to some extent in ethical fashion, sustainable food, social impact media, other creative businesses, and what we call creative places or the real estate where creative activity happens and ex creative experiences are shared. Got it. If we get down to the specific creative level as individuals, if you're graduating from school and you're a creative person, generally speaking, you're going to be sucked up into the industries of either entertainment or marketing. Do you have any words of wisdom in terms of why one might consider an alternate path that flows down this line of impact? Because the first thought that most people have in their mind is, how am I going to survive? Not, how can I give back to my community? The younger generation is trying to balance both how do I give back to my community and how do I work at a job that I'm proud of and happy to be part of every day. What you just described was probably more true in you know 1987 when I was graduating from college. I think that the younger generation is approaching this a little bit differently now, which is a good thing. The person who's coming out of school and is taking that more traditional path, I think that is great. They need to get out of the protective bubble of being in school and be out in the world and they have to find their own voice and they have to discover how they're going to express their ideas and what the stories are that they want to tell and they will arrive at whatever their original contribution is going to be through their creative practice. I think that's great. I'm encountering a lot of creative people who have had a more traditional creative career and then a little bit later on, based on that experience, are recognizing that the way they can scale and sustain their ideas and do the work they want to do in the world is by launching a social purpose business. And happy to describe a couple of those examples. I think you need to be out in the world a little bit and be finding your voice and figuring out what, what you want to turn your talents to. For sure, for sure. Let's hear a couple of those real world examples. I think it's always great to anchor the theoretical inside of reality. What are some of these artist innovators that are out there changing the world? 
Matthew Moore is a fourth generation family farmer and an artist in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, his work has been shown around the United States, Crystal Bridges Museum in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. It's been shown in Asia. He received the very prestigious Creative Capital Fellowship some years back. And so his work originally, his studio practice was around the issues, the topics that he encountered as a fourth generation family farmer, questions around where does your food come from? Sustainable food, the future of the family farm in the United States. A lot of the family farmland was being sold off and being used to do home building in the greater Phoenix area. And so he would plant crops as scale models of the housing developments and then take aerial photographs of them. He would do a set of sculptures of ugly carrots, very large scale ugly carrots, because they grew a lot of carrots on the farm. And so he was working from his perspective at that intersection of art and farming and food. And over time, he kept stretching how he could get this message out. And at one point he thought he was gonna start a nonprofit, but he felt like that was taking him away from his creative practice and the trade-off was not gonna be worth it. And so Matt's someone I've known and we've been working together for eight, or eight years or so now. And he's now recognizing that social purpose businesses, that's the mechanism that will allow him to do the work he wants to do in the world. So he's a very energetic and creative guy, and he's got a couple of things on the go with a business partner who's a third generation Phoenix restaurateur. They're launching Greenbelt Hospitality, which is democratizing farm to table dining. So rather than a once in a lifetime experience, it's something that your family can afford to enjoy once a week. And the first location for Greenbelt Hospitality will be Los Olivos Park in downtown Phoenix. So this is basically an amenity within the park very accessible to the public on neutral territory. So it's not got a sense of this is only for elite folks or people in a more high scale neighborhood. It's on public parkland and it's a combination of a marketplace for locally produced artisanal organic food products, a grab and go cafe, a sit down restaurant, an education space, and an arts inspired playground for the kids and a one acre organic farm with a full time farmer. So you, you can see where things are being grown, you can enjoy them uh, as they're prepared at the restaurant, you can buy them at the cafe. And it's a conception that only an artist could come up with. And it's the sort of conception that a city like Phoenix would only embrace if it was brought to them by an artist who'd already been doing public art installations in the city. So if a real estate developer came in and said, hey, give me a couple acres of your public park land, I'm, I'm going to build a restaurant, that would not fly. But Matt was recognized as someone who was already bringing creativity in a public facing way to the landscape of Phoenix. And so he was a trusted partner from the beginning. He's expressing the same things today as a business leader that he was working on in his studio eight, 10 years ago when he was doing sculpture and photography. I love that story. That's really interesting. You're almost describing a track where the artist in his or her pursuit of understanding a problem and expressing it has to deeply embed themselves in the culture of the place and understand that problem really deeply. Because that's the only way that you can actually come up with the proper solutions that will holistically embed itself within the culture and the community to give back to it. The difference between starting off as an artist versus starting off as a social innovator is almost like the difference between starting off with the heart versus starting off with the mind. When you describe this sort of artist to entrepreneur track, is there a framework that you guys have developed that you help mentor artists who have been doing some kind of exploration but don't know necessarily how to entrepreneurialize their craft? That's not where we're focused. We're typically focused with the artist entrepreneur, the artist innovator who is investment ready and looking to raise capital. And that's the part of the ecosystem where we've been putting our energy. The inspiration for Upstart Collab was people like Matt. It was how do you make it easier for someone like Matt to be able to access impact investment capital when he's ready to do that? And so preparing the ecosystem to be able to embrace a creative person and give them the same level of respect and appreciation that the Stanford or the Harvard MBA who says, I want to make the world a better place would receive more naturally in the current environment. That's what it's all about. But typically we're working with folks when they're investment ready. From time to time, uh, because there's somebody who is either adjacent to us 
or we feel like we'll learn a lot by walking alongside them, we do spend a little extra time. We have a set of resources we typically will point entrepreneurs to. Some of them are on the website of Duke University's Center for Advancing Social Entrepreneurship, which goes by the acronym CASE. They have something called Smart Impact Capital, which is a set of video and written lessons for all social entrepreneurs about how you bake in the impact to your business plan, what investors uh, are expecting when they're looking to put capital into an opportunity, how to divine which sort of capital and which investor is right for you as an entrepreneur. So I will give another example though of an entrepreneur where we have spent some additional time. I'm talking to you today from the Hudson Valley of New York State, about two hours north of Manhattan. And I've been a weekend resident here for about 20 years, but I've been here a lot more since March. And uh, typically I've not been as invested in this community as I have my community in Manhattan. And in 2016, a, a mutual friend introduced me to the actress director, Mary Stuart Masterson, who people may remember from Fried Green Tomatoes and Some Kind of Wonderful and a bunch of movies. She is also a Hudson Valley resident. She had moved up here about 2014 or so with her family. And she's a working actress and immediately she was offered a TV series that was shooting in Vancouver. And she thought, I just moved my family up here. The kids just started school to have to go to the other side of the continent for work. Why Vancouver? Why can't we have film and TV production here in the Hudson Valley? And here was someone who she's been an actor since she was seven years old. Uh, she's been a writer and producer as well. And suddenly she was solving a problem for herself, but she also quickly realized she was solving a problem for the community because this is a place that's very beautiful. The Hudson River School painters knew what they were talking about when they uh, shone a spotlight on this region, but it's not a place with a lot of quality jobs. IBM was here 20, 25 years ago. They employed a lot of people, they paid well, but they closed their campuses in the region and they've never been replaced by another employer. So she set out to build this film and TV ecosystem, which included lobbying the state capital to get a tax credit to make it financially attractive for producers to bring their project to the region. She uh, launched a nonprofit to train a diverse 21st century production crew, the people who run the cameras and the sound and move the set pieces and make the costumes and drive and the production assistants, 150 to 200 of those jobs exist on every TV series. And so even if people would wanna to come to this region, they would need to have that sort of workforce generally already resident for it to make sense for them to do it. They're not gonna import 200 people from the outside to do the work. And now she's launched a women-led, environmentally friendly, public benefit corporation uh, sound studio, sound stages. And so the business model is film, TV production come in, they're tenants to this space. Up River Studios is not developing the content, but it is the factory where the content will get made. And this becomes a real economic engine for the whole region because it's not just hiring local people, but folks, are working on this production, they rent houses, they buy gas, they go to the dentist, they put their kids in school, they attend church, they go to the dry cleaner. There's a whole hive of people who come here. And then when a region is showcased in film and TV, there are a lot of examples where it becomes a tourist destination. And this is already a beautiful spot and a pretty popular tourist destination, but that would be an addition as well. We spent a lot of time with Mary Stewart Masterson and her business partner, Beth Davenport. They had the impetus, they had the deep commitment to, to the community, they had the deep commitment to making sure that the jobs on film and TV can be held by women, people of color, returning veterans, folks who would not necessarily be in those jobs traditionally. I was actually with them yesterday, helping an impact investor do a site visit to see the facility. And we hope that a couple of the members of the Upstart Collab impact investor member community will be closing commitments into Upriver Studios in the next few weeks. So we've learned a lot with them about film and TV and media. So it's helped our team be smarter about that industry that part of the creative economy, but it's also been a really good lesson about how you engage the local community to benefit from what 
the company's doing. And it's been fascinating to tutor a really accomplished creative person who's got all the right instincts and make sure she has the right concepts and vocabulary so she can be well understood by impact investors. That makes sense. In terms of like the language to better speak to impact investors, and there are a whole bunch of different financial institutions that people have options for, what are impact investors and CDFIs and all these different institutions that have capital, what are they looking for in creative businesses? They're looking for the same thing in creative businesses that they're looking for in anything else that they are considering investing in. So they're looking for a um, sizable and robust market segment something that at the industry level or the opportunity level makes sense. They're looking for a clear path to financial return. They're looking for a capable, equipped entrepreneur with the right team around them and the right set of advisors around them. They're looking for something that other investors will participate in alongside. And they're looking to understand if the definition of impact is the same and if the commitment to impact is deep. So you've probably heard the term impact washing, people who, after they have failed to meet their financial return targets claim, oh, but we were an impact investment. And so we were expecting people to take a concessionary level of return because our impact was going to be so high or folks who start to use language around impact. But if you dig in, it's really not anchored deep in the product, service, or platform that their company is bringing forward. It's like, we're going to make money and then we'll have a little sort of giving arm over to the side. Those models are outmoded at this moment. And so impact investors are looking for really integrated, inextricably linked impact in the opportunities that they're considering. Got it. When it comes to COVID, specifically the sectors that you play in are food, fashion, real estate, media, and every single one of these are industries that have been hit particularly hard. Have you seen that artists or those within the creative economy demonstrate increased resilience compared to others? And if so, can you give some specific examples of that? I will give you the example of Patrick Robinson, who's the entrepreneur behind Pasco. Patrick is a well-known in the fashion space. He was the creative director at The Gap, Emporio Armani. I guess about three years ago, he launched his own fashion brand called Pasco. Patrick is an African-American entrepreneur. He was growing the company with a real focus on environmental sustainability. He was working to produce all of the clothes in uh, environmentally and ethically certified factories in Vietnam and China. He was very attuned to the packaging around the clothes being environmentally sustainable, recognizing that fashion is a very dirty business. And that was the problem he originally had in mind to solve when he launched the company. And then the summer happened, COVID, making it difficult to import goods from Asia. And then as a Black entrepreneur, he responded in a very heartfelt way to the death of George Floyd and all of the really terrible things that the U.S. has had to reckon with over the past few months. So since July 12th, he has completely pivoted the company to what's now called community made. And so instead of producing the clothes in ethical, sustainable factories in Asia and bringing them to the United States, he's onshoring all production to the U.S. And he's doing it in a very special way. So the community made model is one of distributed home-based production. So in bringing to the United States a model that's very familiar in the artisan economy in the developing world where there is a company in the formal economy, but the workforce will, will be women working at home making baskets or weaving, or that's very familiar in the artisan space. So Patrick is adapting a version of that to do in the U.S. There are a lot of tailors and seamstresses out of work. All of the costume shops that support Broadway have been closed since March, and they're going to be closed until you know, fall of 2021. That means there are a lot of incredibly talented tailors and seamstresses who aren't working. The, the tailors who are in the dry cleaners all over the US, the tailors and seamstresses who've been working in factories around the United States, a lot of people are out of work and they're highly skilled and they're able to replicate at home the work that they have typically been doing out of the home. And, and Community Made is a new platform that is all about sourcing goods in a sustainable way managing distributed home-based production so people during COVID can work safely at home, and then 
distributing the goods in an environmentally sustainable way. I saw Patrick the other day and the first clothes from Community Made will be out in the next uh, month or so, which is super exciting because they this was not conceived until the middle of July and to have the first clothes out to customers so quickly is phenomenal. But what Patrick's realizing is this can be done not just for Pasco brand clothes, this can be done for other fashion lines as well. And this can be done not just for fashion, but it can be done for home goods or any sort of designed goods. And so ultimately what he's done is not just develop a new clothing line, he's developed a new sustainable platform that's thinking about the environment, thinking about safety and opportunity for workers. He's working now with his lawyers to figure out how gig workers can uh, earn equity in the company. So he's going to be pioneering new ways to create access to wealth building. And this is all the result of a creative person responding to not just one tragedy, but two, COVID and the reckoning to social justice in the United States, taking two really horrific events and creating something really positive that will have long lasting effects. That's so beautiful. Is there a reason that you think creatives are better at these kind of pivots? I do think that the instincts of the artist and designer around embracing failure, trial and error, being able to see not just black and white, but gray. On our Upstart Collab website, which is upstartco-lab.org, in the research tab, there's a report that we did four or five years ago, Great Minds Don't Think Alike, and it's looking at artists in the context of business, government, and society with a lot of examples and stories. We boil down some of the traits and characteristics that we think artists bring to their work as social entrepreneurs. So I encourage people to take a look at that report. Very cool. All right, so let's shift the conversation to something a little bit more personal. You've been in and out of the creative economy over the last 30 years. I'm curious to know, how has your perspective of creativity and the arts shifted over the course of your lifetime from when you majored in theater all the way till now? Has the roles of the arts in our culture and the relevance of it in society changed? Or has it been more or less consistent from your perspective? I think it's been consistent. I think the recognition of it has changed. On Friday, we we had an event. It was something co-hosted between Upstart Collab and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And it talked about the role of culture, community, impact capital, COVID recovery, all of those themes brought together. And the fact that there would be a conversation about the importance of creativity hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York with the president of the New York Fed spending three hours of his day engaged in this conversation, to me, demonstrates what's possible in terms of the recognition that can happen about the role that creativity and culture plays in community and in the vibrant life of the city, both in terms of being an economic engine, in terms of businesses and jobs and growing wealth and how important it is for New York City. It's a real center for fashion and publishing and advertising and music and theater and restaurants. But equally, we spent time on the role that art and culture plays in the social well-being of low-income communities. And there's research out of University of Pennsylvania led by Dr. Mark Stern that talks about how a lot of communities that are considered under-resourced from an economic wealth perspective are surprisingly strong in terms of the cultural assets that they have there, which suggests that's a foothold, that's a beginning point to be able to invest in those communities and stabilize and strengthen those communities. Mark has been doing his research for 20 something years. It's research that's been known about and funded and appreciated in the philanthropy community of the big foundations in the U.S. and among arts leaders. But bringing that into a conversation about community development and impact investing is important because it shows that we don't have to wonder whether arts and culture, creativity can be helpful, can be positive forces, can be big levers of impact. We've got the data on that. But typically, the people that we had together in the conversation on Friday are not in a conversation together. Typically, the people from the banks are not in conversation with the arts leaders. Building those bridges, creating those ties, that's something that Upstart's been working very hard at. It's really interesting and exciting that recognition is changing over time. Prior to starting at Upstart CoLab, you were working at the National Endowment for the Arts. 
How did your time there shape your view of the creative economy? It was from that vantage point that I realized the the missing opportunity for the creative sector in the United States. In the U.S., a little bit different from Canada, the the typical cooperation between philanthropic funding and government funding is that foundations are typically the research and development capital for new social ideas. And then once the idea is demonstrated, whether it's for early childhood education or health interventions or whatever it is, once philanthropy has helped to demonstrate how a a new approach, a new initiative can be successful, government is one of the ways that idea gets to scale. But the numbers are flipped in terms of arts and culture in the United States. So the federal government's arts budget is about $150, $160 million a year, which is not a lot of money. The philanthropy that supports arts in America annually is about $20, $21 billion a year, which is good because we just went from millions to billions. But as I mentioned before, in the U.S., there's $12 trillion of sustainable and impact investment capital. So if just a small fraction of that really big number could be intentionally thinking about arts, design, culture, heritage, and creativity, the businesses and the real estate developments that can accept investment as opposed to philanthropic support and use that investment capital to grow, that would be a really sizable, important infusion of resources into the creative sector. And so that became very clear to me from the vantage point of leading the National Arts Agency for the United States. That was the impetus to go back to the world that I knew better, which is that world at the intersection of philanthropy and impact investment, to launch Upstart Collab five years ago and and to work on all the things we've been talking about today. Yeah. And how has that journey been for you as someone who's just launched into this brand new endeavor, like the ups and the downs? Can you share a couple of them? Just to say, I became an entrepreneur for the first time on my 50th birthday. You had asked a question before about what do you do when you get out of art school and what's the path and when you should decide you want to be the entrepreneur in your career. That's probably later than a lot of folks uh, might think is optimal. Sometimes it's later than I think is optimal, but everything I had done up to that point from my first internship in high school, contributed to Upstart Collab. So my background, which is, as you mentioned, unusual combination of Wall Street, the arts community, philanthropy, all of that's come together in a very powerful way and has been the right preparation for what we're trying to do, which is at the intersection of all of these communities, all of these forces. I will say My learning personally as an entrepreneur is you need to hold on to your belief in that big idea and the long-term goal that you're driving towards. And you need to be optimistic and intuitive and trust yourself, all of those things that artists are so good at, but you need to be radically practical every step of the way in order to have the budget, make the post the wins, make the progress to be able to get to that long-term goal. All right, one last question. If you had a megaphone to the world, what would you like to say? Everyone has the potential to be investing in a sustainable and impactful way, whether it's through your checking account, whether it's through your credit debit card, whether it's through a certificate of deposit. There are opportunities across every asset class to invest in a way that is thinking about workers, communities, and the planet. So if you've not dug into this yet, there's a wide world out there. There are lots of people willing to help you engage. And increasingly, there'll be opportunities for you to align your capital with impact through the creative economy. Alrighty, folks, that was Laura Callanan from Upstart Collab. You can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And their website is spelled upstartco-lab.org. As always, you can head over to impacteverywhere.org to see the summary write-out, transcript, or show notes, as well as some beautiful graphics that you can share to your friends and family. Next week, we have Brett Kugelmas from the Impact Energy Center, where he's going to be covering nuclear energy and why it is the singular most effective solution to combat climate change. I found it to be a really interesting episode in a field where I had very little expertise. If that sounds interesting, make sure to tune in and don't forget to stay positive because impact is everywhere.